um, today we're going to be covering the federal relief and stimulus programs for all small businesses during this COVID-19 crisis. So for today's webinar, if you are having any issues um, with hearing, feel free to just call in. So the call in number is listed right here and the webinar ID is listed as well. So today during questions, there is a question and answer box. Please submit any questions through there. Seeing as we only have about an hour, you know, we're not gonna be able to answer every single question. So any unanswered questions will be sent over to the speakers to answer after the webinar. We will post them after on our resources page. We'll share that link in a second. And then if you do have any other questions, feel free to send me an email. My, my email is hisela at generator.com. Um, so please feel free to shoot me an email. If you are having any technology issues, um, you know, unfortunately, we're not going to be able to solve those technology issues with the amount of attendees that we do have today. So we will be recording this webinar and we'll be sharing it under our emergency response program website. So under the resources page, if you go to generator.com slash emergency dash response dash program slash resources, that is where you'll find it. We will also send out an email afterwards. So to kick it off, I'm going to pass it over to one of the partners at Generator, Troy, so he can introduce our speakers for today. Yeah, my pleasure. Hello, everyone. Thanks for signing into this webinar. Uh, it's my pleasure to have two very special guests with us from Foley and Lardner. Uh, first, uh, my good friend, Eric Hatchell. Eric is based out of Foley's Madison office uh, and uh, works in a variety of legal areas, but we're really fortunate to have Eric, uh, in particular, his work with clients as they navigate these federal stimulus issues. Uh, and then Anne-Marie. Anne-Marie is a partner at Foley and Lardner based in their Detroit office, and she is actually leading Foley's Coronavirus Task Force. Uh, so she's a co-founder of the firm's Coronavirus Resource Center. She has been leading the charge at Foley in terms of doing all of the legislative research and policy research and advising uh, not only her clients, but advising all the various partners and attorneys across the entire United States for all Foley offices. So we're really honored uh, to have both Eric and Anne-Marie with us. So with that, just to reiterate uh, Hisela's points, uh, if you have any questions, there's a Q&A function on the bottom of your Zoom screen. You can sim simply click that and type in any questions that you have. Uh, our guests today, Anne-Marie and Eric, will be reviewing those questions and chiming in with various answers. Uh, but without further ado, I will let Hisela transfer her uh, screen over to Anne-Marie and let her take it away. Thank you. Um, well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I think I'm unmuted, so if anyone who's on my screen can hear me, it looks good. Um, greetings from Detroit, um, and thanks for having us. We really appreciate the opportunity to, to share this with you. Um, as, uh, as Troy mentioned, um, Foley um, put together a coronavirus task force um, a little over a month ago. You know, my practice in particular focuses a lot on supply chain issues, manufacturers and the like. And in Detroit, we saw a need when things were, you know, really heating up in the affected regions in China, um, really focused on the supply chain and the disruption to the supply chain. And um, you know, we didn't imagine even then with what we knew that it would grow into um, the unfortunate pandemic that everybody is, is really suffering through in one way or another. So um, first I wanna start by saying thanks for having me and welcome. Um, I hope everybody is, is doing as well as they can be under these circumstances. It's been, um, it's been one heck of a, you know, last month I think for everybody. Um, just to set the table a little bit, um, I'm gonna take just a couple of minutes to talk about our um, coronavirus resource um, center, which is available to everybody who's on this um, webinar. We're gonna make some materials um, uniquely available to this group that we have not posted on our site. Um, it'll be some of the materials that we referenced during um, this presentation regarding the CARES Act and regarding the, um, the PPP loans and the EIDL loans in particular. Um, but just, you know, in terms of other resources that are available to you, um, we have a center that's set up on our website at foley.com. It's a cross-discipline group of probably more than 100, 140 lawyers across the country. 
um, in really any discipline, any industry you can imagine, I think, which is being affected by um, the coronavirus, uh, particularly here in North America. Um, I even had my cannabis industry team post something last week about the impact of the coronavirus on that industry, if it gives you an example of how widespread this impact is and, and you know how much it is hitting, I think, small businesses in particular. That has been much of the focus of our work recently. We started out a few weeks ago when the emergency orders were taking place throughout the country. You know, it started in the Northern um, California Bay Area and then, you know, quickly spread throughout the country. The impact of those emergency orders at the state and local level on small businesses, you know, I don't have to tell anyone in this group about because unfortunately, I'm sure that many of you are experiencing that. Um, and then, uh, you know, following, that was sort of the hot issue for a while was, you know, am I an essential business? How can I operate? That sort of thing. We have a lot of materials on that. And as that develops further, because I think we'll be coming back to that at some point as we come out of those emergency orders. So right now those are so widespread and I think businesses are sort of hunkered down where they need to be under those orders. But what we expect is that as those orders become lifted, which will happen at some point, as this pandemic is brought under control, there'll be a lot of questions then about bringing people back up online and bringing businesses back up online. So I think that's an issue that um, a lot of people will be focused on. Um, to set the table for today, we've been asked to give an outline of the relief that's available under the CARES Act. Um, we now have the third iteration of the CARES Act, which has been you know, enacted into law. Um, there is a fourth version of that, which will be on the way. Um, we have government solutions lawyers at Foley who are tracking that legislation, former members of Congress and the like. Um, and, you know, that is still very much TBD. You know, it is, it is underway right now. I think there's a strong consensus that there will be additional relief. The question is, you know, to whom it will be targeted and, and how widespread and effective it will be. Um, and there's been um, a lot of speculation about, you know, an extension of some of the benefits that are available under the current CARES Act. So um, what we're going to do this morning, this afternoon rather, is try to give you as, as current as we can. Um, you will see if you go on our resource center, we posted on the SBA loans maybe a little over a week ago, you know, when they were first enacted. Um, then last week, we got guidance from the Treasury Department that came out, so we've updated for that. Um, also, over the weekend, um, there was some guidance issued with respect to private equity and venture capital. So it's a very fluid situation. Um, some of the questions that folks have are still unclear, even with the guidance that we've gotten from Treasury. So um, I want to kind of give that qualifier as we talk through what the eligibility rules are and sort of how these grants or loans function. Um, you know, just, just keep in mind the fluidity of this and that, you know, each, um, each company has its own set of facts. Each company will use this money, you know, according to, you know, its own application and the rules associated with it. So some of the stuff that we're providing today will be, you know, black and white rules. You can, you can take it to the bank, as they say. Um, unfortunately, there are some gray areas and we'll highlight those um, where we can as well. Um, I wanna thank uh, my colleague, Eric Hatchell, for joining us today. Um, Eric comes to us by way of Madison, um, Wisconsin. I'm in Detroit. Um, Eric has been spending a lot of time over the last week or so counseling clients with other partners at Foley regarding these loans. Um, so we're gonna kind of tag team this a little bit and um, hopefully the technology will, um, will cooperate with us. <laughs> so, um, with that, I'm going to try to bring up what I wanna share with everybody. And if I had my training done right, then this will work. I'm gonna go to full view. Give me just a minute. Uh, 
Stop share. That's the wrong one. So forgive me, but we'll get through this. I almost have it. Share. Uh, give me one second. I apologize. Yep. So if you just again, oh, the here share I, am. Screen. I just okay. had the wrong one. Yeah, <laughs> I found it. Okay, this one should work. Oh, I got a full screen. Okay, I think everybody should see something on their screen that refers to these programs. Um, and you got it. Looks good. Arm, if that's not the case. Um, okay, so we're going to start off talking about the PPP. Um, we have looked at the business lending programs under the CARES Act, and you know, really, so far there are three. We've got the Paycheck Protection Program, the so-called PPP loans. Um, there is also the EIDL loans, um, the economic injury. And then finally, there's what is referred to as the 454 loans for mid-sized businesses. Um, we do have some materials on the 454 loans. We're not going to focus on that today um, because, as I understand it, the audience is more geared toward the SBA um, group, which would be focused on the PPP and the EIDL loans. Um, so we're gonna start off talking about um, the Paycheck Protection Program loans. Um, and that is the program which, um, for which guidance came out late last week from the Treasury Department. Some of those applications are underway with banks. Some banks are just catching up to that and haven't yet actually released the applications. So it depends on um, who you're working with. Um, but the Paycheck Protection Program generally covers the period from mid-February, February 15th through June 30th. And what it does is it expands the SBA loan eligibility to help out companies and employees who are dealing with the effects of the coronavirus outbreak. Um, it allows businesses which are suffering due to the coronavirus outbreak to borrow money for a number of qualified costs that are set forth in the um, legislation. And the costs under the PPP are related to mainly employee compensation and benefits. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about, you know, the definition of how you um, roll up with your, with your payroll number. Um, and then what you can do with the money once you get it. So just to step back a minute, if you look at the PPP program, um, you consider, are you eligible? And if so, what are you applying for? What's the dollar amount you're applying for and how do you land on that number? And then really as important is, what can you use those funds for and in what time period so that hopefully you can maximize converting this loan into a grant based on the forgiveness aspects of the program. Um, so let's start first about, you know, are you eligible? Um, eligibility for the program um, focuses on the number of employees and what industry you are in. Generally speaking, very generally speaking, you know, many of these are capped at 500 employees. Um, there are certain industries where the cap is greater and it goes up to, for example, 1,500 employees in the case of some manufacturing, to give an example. Um, so the first question that a business has to ask itself is, you know, am I eligible based on the number of employees? Um, you know, and, and the calculation of the number of employees that you have is sometimes really simple. You know, you're a single business um, and you have, you know, 12 employees, bam. You know, you're, uh, and, and those employees are located in the United States, you're a US business. It can get a little more complicated when you consider um, affiliates and the location of different employees and the like. So we're gonna touch on that for a minute, but let me start with the most basic. Um, the PPP loans are extended to sole proprietorships. You know, a single person entity is now eligible under these PPP loans. And that is, you know, that is a change. So the first thing you want to do is look at what is your number of employees. 
Um, this becomes a little bit complicated, as I said, if you have multiple entities, if you have cross ownership between multiple entities. So I'm gonna take a minute and talk about that. And those are called the affiliation rules. Um, the SBA looks at the number of employees that you have by also considering affiliates. Um, and you know, in some cases, I've talked to clients in the last week who have said to me, you know, yeah, I own three different companies, but those companies don't have anything to do with each other. I'm the owner of all three and I control all three, but they operate completely independent of each other. And you know, the general answer is the SBA doesn't care. <laughs> they have um, published affiliation rules that um, focus on bringing those companies together for purposes of determining eligibility. And so I'll touch on this briefly. Um, affiliation is found where one either controls or has the power to control both entities or multiple entities, um, or where a third party has that sort of control, the ability to control. It does not matter if control is or has ever been exercised. All that matters is that there exists the ability to control. Um, in determining whether control exists, um, the SBA looks at kind of four different tests, if you will. One is an affiliation based on ownership, and that's what I mentioned earlier. Um, another can be an affiliation based on stock options, convertible securities, or agreements to merge. Um, so if you have any of that at issue with multiple entities, you wanna peel that apart and get some advice to figure out if those entities must be affiliated for purposes of the SBA. Um, a third test is based on management, where there's common management between the two. Um, and finally, there's a test based on identity of interest. Um, that tends to come up where, you know, maybe you have a front family office that owns, you know, multiple portfolio companies and different members of the family control different portfolio companies. Depending on the degree of control, and the relationships between those individuals, then affiliation can be found based on the identity of interest. Um, so the, the main thing that I would say, if you've got multiple entities, if they all add up to fewer than the 500 employees, for example, excuse me, for example, then you don't care. You know, where you care is if you've got one small business, which has fewer than 500 employees, but if you consider an affiliate, it takes you over the threshold. You've got 5,000 employees abroad who are doing something for an affiliate. Um, so the answer to whether affiliates are always you know, included is the following. If you use the definition that the SBA puts out and the guidance that the SBA puts out, that will determine whether your related companies whether a subsidiary or not even a subsidiary, but another company that you own is affiliated for purposes of the PPP loan. That is a threshold inquiry that everybody should make um, to determine their eligibility in the first instance for PPP loan. And I may be glossed over this, but the reason the PPP loans are so attractive is because if certain conditions are met, it converts to a grant, so it's free money. Um, and you know we're going to talk, and Eric is going to talk in particular about how to convert that to a grant. You know, you just have to follow the guidelines that are set forth in the legislation on the use of the funds. Um, when you apply, um, the application will ask about affiliates. And so, just one word of caution: every single application which is signed and submitted for a PPP loan, if it results in a PPP loan, is a certification that the um, applicant is making, and it's subject to the False Claims Act, which is um, uh, an act which has civil as well as potentially criminal liability for misrepresentations. Um, and so I cannot, overstate how important it is when you submit the application
to be thoughtful. And if you're unsure about whether to include affiliates, get some advice on your specific facts and see if they are part of your number for purposes of eligibility. One footnote I'll mention as well is the different affiliates can apply for different loans. So if you have you know, two affiliates who meet the affiliate test and so their employees have to be, um, they have to be combined for purposes of eligibility, one of the affiliates has 10 employees, the other has 50, and 500 is the limit for this example. Um, those two entities can still apply for separate loans. Um, they just have to combine their numbers for purposes of determining the number of employee eligibility. Um, okay, so that's sort of covered the water on the number of employees and are you eligible. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about how you calculate the dollar amount that you're applying for, and then we're gonna pivot over to Eric, and he's gonna talk about how and when you spend the money in order to maximize your, um, your ability to convert this to a grant. We're probably gonna spend a little more time on the PPP loans than we are on EIDL, but we will get to EIDL as well. Um, again, because the PPP loans are the ones that so many are focused on being so attractive because you, you know, can convert it to a grant. Um, you've probably heard this about the PPP loans. You can take out two and a half times your monthly payroll, okay? And so the question is, what is your monthly payroll? And the goal would be to make that number as great as you can within the meaning of the statute, of course, so that you can maximize the amount that you're taking out and therefore use it and maximize your forgiveness and the grant aspect of this. Um, so the way that you calculate it is you refer to the definition in the act. Um, and again, I'll mention, you're gonna get these materials that we're posting during these comments. Um, on the bottom left corner, there's a website that references our resource center, the foley.com slash coronavirus. And you will find in there alerts that we have put out, which really detail, you know, these, these things that go into how you calculate employee payroll. But generally speaking, it's a very broad definition. Um, it includes things like your health care expense. Obviously, it includes your, 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 your payroll, your wages, but it includes things like health care um, and other items. It excludes a few important things. It excludes compensation in excess of $100,000 a year. So if you have employees who are paid greater than $100,000 a year, the amount in excess of $100,000 is excluded, not the whole amount, and that's been a question a lot of clients have is, do I have to throw out the whole salary for that person? The answer is no, you just cannot include any amount in excess of $100,000, prorated for the 12 months. Um, it also excludes um, withholding taxes, and it excludes the pay for employees who are located outside of the United States. Um, and so, your, again, your goal is to try to put as much as you can into that number so that when you multiply it by two and a half, you know, two and a half times, you've got a greater number to work with um, once you get the loan. Um, just a couple of sort of big picture things and then we'll turn it to Eric regarding use of the loan and, um, and how you apply for the grant aspect of it. Um, again, Solo, you know, sole proprietorships, single person entities may apply, nonprofits may apply, and indeed the guidance that we got over the weekend includes a religious exemption for organizations in that space when it comes to the affiliate rules. So if you are a religious organization, by chance, um, you should look closely at those affiliate rules um, as you're determining um, your eligibility and your payroll. Um, and this is just another screen that gives you, you know, sort of a little more visual on the program itself. The company that is applying had to have been in operation as of February 15th of this year. 
Um, you cannot be a debtor in bankruptcy. That was clarified over the weekend or late last week. So if you are a chapter 11 debtor in bankruptcy, you cannot apply. Um, you won't be eligible. Um, you apply directly through your bank, which is sponsoring you know, the SBA loans. Um, they are for a two year term with a 1% interest rate. The interest rate um, that was originally noted last week was half a percent with a 10 year term. So that's an update over the weekend based on the discussions between lenders and the SBA. Um, the, uh, you don't have to show that you've sought credit elsewhere. Um, it's not based on your credit worthiness. And indeed you can defer payments under this for up to six months. So, you know, the idea would be, and the best planning would be, take out the loan, use the money in accordance with the, you know, requirements of the statute, and then seek the forgiveness, and you're not paying on that loan, you know, during that time frame. One other note on counting employees, it includes all of your employees, full-time, part-time, and other status. It does not include independent contractors, you know, who are a 1099 type situation. And the reason is those individuals can apply on their own. So, you know, there's no, there's no double dip that's permitted um, in, in this program. The loans can be up to $10 million and they are, and this is critical, first come, first serve. Um, we have been advising our clients to try to work with their existing lender because in many cases, that's just faster and where you already have that relationship set up, it's probably going to go better for you. Um, however, these are first come, first serve, and some lenders are not yet online with their applications. Some lenders have announced, Wells, for example, today announced that it was um, only um, processing loans for nonprofits and small businesses with 50 or fewer employees um, or under 50 employees, one of the two. Um, and so, you know, if you're doing business with a bank that doesn't yet have its application up or with a bank that is, you know, only um, providing loans to a subgroup of SBA that does not include you, there's a lot of reasons why, you know, one or more banks will do that. Our advice is, you know, Get, a, get an application underway because this money is projected to run out. Um, although the applications are open through June 30th, every consultant that I have seen commenting on this has expressed that these funds are finite and they will run out. So um, that's an important thing for people to understand because sometimes you might want to maybe delay the origination date for reasons, you know, that with your employees and when they're working and the like, can't really do that here because you might get left, you know, holding nothing um, when this is over. Um, the last thing I'll mention before giving it to um, to Eric to talk about how you use the money and how you um, how you are eligible for the forgiveness is an important one. There's no guarantee required here, so the individual owner. Um, no matter what percentage you own, you do not guarantee these loans. So the, the best practice, this really is free money for companies that can manage their eligibility, their application, and then most important, and what Eric is gonna talk about now, and I'll give him the microphone, is the use of the funds. Um, because if you use the funds the right way, um, and if you meet the requirements of the act, this converts to a free money grant for you. Um, so with that, I'm gonna mute and Eric, I'll, I'll give it to you. Thank you, Anne-Marie. Can, can you hear me? Are we good? Yep. yep. Well, picking up on Anne-Marie's point about the urgency and the importance acting on this right away, we can't stress that enough. Applications just opened on Friday. There's been $349 billion added, allocated to this program 
We don't know, of course, if there'll be more money allocated later, but to date, there's only been 349 billion allocated. I just texted a banker who's following this closely, and he told me that there's been already 37 billion or close to 10% submitted. And again, this just opened on Friday. So we do expect these funds to go very quickly. And while there may be some strategies of trying to time when you apply and when you get the loan based on how the forgiveness works, which I'll get into here shortly, we can't stress enough. You should be reaching out to your bankers um, right now. If you, you know, 55% of us, I think on this call, haven't submitted anything yet. Uh, we can't stress enough the urgency to do that right away if you're eligible and if you're gonna seek loans under this program. So let's talk about the forgiveness. That's everybody's favorite part. Who doesn't love free government money? I like to think about this kind of in two buckets. The first bucket is what Anne Marie just described and that's what's the maximum loan you can be eligible for and apply for and that generally is calculated by taking two and a half times your payroll costs for a maximum of $10 million. So that's kind of, think about that as bucket one, the maximum loan you can apply for. And the second bucket is how much of that loan can be forgiven? And the act clearly spells out the types of expenses that can be forgiven. And, and note, when we talked about the maximum loan, we were focusing solely on payroll costs. And you look at your payroll cost and how that term is defined to determine how big your loan can be. The forgiveness bucket is much bigger. There are in addition, additional expenses other than payroll costs which can be used to seek forgiveness. So the way it works is loans are forgiven for eight weeks from when you get the loan, okay? So when you get the loan, eight weeks of expenses are eligible for forgiveness. And there's certain category of expenses that are covered and that includes payroll costs, so salary, wages, vacation, parental, sick leave, healthcare benefits, retirement benefit plans, that's all included under payroll costs. All of those costs are forgiven. It also includes interest on mortgage obligation, it also includes any rent for leases that were in existence prior to February 15th. And finally, utilities. So payroll costs, interest on mortgage, rent on your leases and utilities. All of those expenses for the eight weeks following the issuance of the loan can be forgiven. <clears throat> now the key of course though, when the act came out, there wasn't any clarification about percentages of how those funds had to be used. Uh, the rules that were issued last week provided some clarification on that. 75% of the loan must be used for payroll costs. And that's because the core purpose of the statute is to ensure that these resources are devoted to payroll. So again, when the act first came out, we didn't know that 75% had to be used on payroll costs, but that's what the rules clearly state now. 75% of the loan must be used for payroll costs, and then you can use the other 25% for things such as rent, utilities, interest on your mortgage. The amount of forgiveness can also be reduced, and we have some questions about this in the Q&A, and we're getting a lot of really good questions, by the way. We'll try, we're gonna have you know 15 minutes here at the end to get to some of these. Um, to the extent we can't get to them all, you know, feel free to reach out to myself, reach out to Anne Marie. Our contact information can be found at Foley.com. You can also get it from Troy. We'll be happy to follow up if we can. Um, but one of the questions we're seeing is, what if we laid employees off? And how does that impact our ability to get forgiveness? And that's a good question. So if you did lay full-time employees off or, if you reduced salaries greater than 70 than 25 percent either of those occurred the amount of your forgiveness can be reduced so for example if you had 20 employees at the same time last year 
and now you only have 10, the forgiveness you're eligible for would be reduced by 50%. But the act also provides an exemption if you want to rehire employees. And you have until June 30th to eliminate any reductions or to make up the percentage in the compensation. So again, so if you've already laid off people, if you've furloughed people, the act allows until June 30th to bring those numbers back and you would still be eligible for the full forgiveness. And excuse me, Eric, can I just emphasize here what you already said, but I wanna make sure people are really clear on this point because of the June 30th date that you just mentioned. The forgiveness is based on the money that you spent in accordance with the act during the eight weeks that follow you getting the money. So you wanna maximize what you're spending in those eight weeks in order to trigger the forgiveness grant aspect of this program. You can't just hold on to your money for three months after origination, hire back employees at the end of June, and then start paying them and try to get forgiveness based on the money that you're spending 12 weeks out. And so I, I just mentioned that to really emphasize the point that the forgiveness is focused on money that you spend during the eight weeks following origination. This can be a little bit of mathematical gymnastics for, for I think folks as they deal with this, but um, that part is really, really clear. So back to you, Eric, but I did wanna put an exclamation on that point. Now, and, and thanks for emphasizing, because people may be thinking, as I said before, trying to time this. You know, you may have, have no work for employees to do. You may have laid off employees, and you may be trying to think about when we can bring these back, bring the employees back, because you want to be paying them when you get the loan for those next eight weeks. Um, but it goes back to my initial point. We don't know how long this money will be around for, and to try to time it based on those facts we think is, is dangerous because the money may not ultimately be there. Uh, real quick, I wanna just talk about what's the actual forgiveness process. This whole PPP program is done through the banks. You know, perhaps some of you on the call may have sought application through the SBA previously, and that was done online on the government website. This is all done through the banks and the forgiveness process is completely done through the banks as well. So you'll be working with your banker to submit the information, to submit the application, then also on the back end, you'll be working with your banker to show and give them documentation about the forgiveness and the banker will be the one certifying that you meet certain requirements. As a kind of a practical tip, practical consideration, we recommend setting up a separate account for these loan funds. And we recommend making payments that you wanna seek forgiveness from that separate account. We just think that's gonna eliminate a lot of headaches for you, a lot of headaches for the bankers, if you have clear separation of where these funds came from and how these funds are being used. That's just gonna make everybody's life a lot simpler. So work with your banker, set up a separate account when these funds come in that you can spend it that way. So at a high level, that's you know how these funds are used and how you can maximize your loan and hopefully try to get all of it eligible for forgiveness. I will uh, kick it back to Anne Marie for a couple of comments about the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program, EIDL. This can be another source of funds for those that are needing assistance in addition to what is available under the uh, PPP program. Thanks, Eric. Um, and the last point about the forgiveness as well is the guidelines say that banks are supposed to respond to your request for forgiveness within 60 days. So a lot of people have asked, you know, when do I know I'm forgiven? How do I know? That sort of thing. Um, the, the guidance, at least, is that they're supposed to respond within 60 days. Um, we're going to spend just a couple minutes on the EIDL and then we'll have some time for some questions. Um, you know, the, the thing on the EIDL loan is it has. Um, it's set aside um, as an economic injury disaster loan, which has funding of $10 billion. 
Um, there are favorable terms for loans up to $2 million. Um, loans for the EIDL cannot cover the same expenses that you are covering with your PPP loan. So, you know, where you're eligible for both, you know, the PPP loan is quite attractive because of the forgiveness aspect to it. The EIDL loan does not have forgiveness, except in one respect that I'll, I'll mention. Um, the loans that you take out under the EIDL um, can be up to $2 million. There is a personal guarantee that is required for loans greater than $200,000 by owners of more than 20% of the business. So that's one thing that makes the EIDL not super attractive for a lot of companies, the notion that you have to provide a personal guarantee if you're going over $200,000 is, you know, kind of a lead balloon for a lot of business entities. Um, another thing that we've gotten a lot of questions about is this access to the $10,000 grant advance. Um, the $10,000 grant advance is available when you apply, and it's designed to quickly put money in the pocket of the small business who needs it. Um, the $10,000 advance in cases where you take out the EIDL loan, and again, it's tied together. You can't just get the $10,000 advance. It's tied to a loan under the program. Um, it, it's, it's, it is forgiven. However, it's a deduct from your forgiveness on the PPP. So, you know, there's some language that the SBA has put out on its website, which says that the $10,000 advance is forgiven and does not need to be repaid. But as you dig further into the requirements under the program, um, that would be an offset of the forgiveness that you get on the PPP. Um, in addition, you know, the same requirements, I would say, with respect to eligibility and um, the need to make accurate and truthful certifications with the application. Um, again, there's no requirement that you demonstrate you can't get credit elsewhere. You have to show that you've, that you've suffered substantial economic injury from COVID-19 and your business must be located in the United States, Puerto Rico, or most US territories. Um, so, and you can use the funds as you see on this graphic here. Um, you can use the funds for payroll, sick leave, et cetera, but again, you can't use them for the same thing that you're using the PPP. Um, as a practical matter, I've seen clients use the EIDL for CapEx, you know, working capital needs, CapEx, other obligations that can't be met because of the impact to your revenue right now. Um, and, uh, and again, you know, this is not a loan that's forgiven. It's got an attractive interest rate. Um, it can have up to, I believe it's a 30 year term. Um, so for some companies, the EIDL will be a bit of a lifeline. You can factor it into your overall planning. Um, but again, you can't, you know, sort of double up um, between the two loans. You're unable to seek recovery under EIDL for the same thing that you've taken out um, under the CARES Act. And the biggest takeaway on the EIDL is just don't forget that guarantee. If you've got multiple owners, anyone who owns a 20% or greater interest is um, going to be required to provide a personal guarantee for that loan. Um, our materials that you get we have information on the so-called 454 loan. Um, we're not going to cover that here in the interest of time and, you know, due to this audience. So I think now I'm going to hand it back. I think it's maybe to Abby and we're going to go through some questions. And if I do this properly, there we go. Okay. We're all back. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you so much, Anne-Marie. Thank you, Eric. So I'm watching a bunch of these questions roll in and it seems like a large handful of folks do have a similar question. And that is that, you know, there are a lot of restaurant owners on the line right now and, you know, several of them are not maybe allowed to work. Um, how do you make use of the PPP if you have employees who are not currently working? Yeah. So let me start with that one. Um, and to answer it, I'm going to start with the purpose of the legislation. Um, 
you know, the purpose of the PPP under the CARES Act and what Congress was solving for was, you know, payroll. It was to provide, you know, wages to, um, to employees who are affected by the coronavirus outbreak. And so recognizing that this has gone on now for, you know, for several weeks, a lot of businesses are closed because of the emergency orders or because people are home caring for their children and can't come to work or indeed because some people are sick. Um, and so, you know, we have been talking with clients about what do I do? You know, I'm gonna pay employees to stay home and do nothing. Um, and the answer is in some cases, yes, because that is consistent with what Congress, you know, enacted and directed for the use of these funds in order to convert it to a grant. So it's not a requirement that you bring your employees back and they actually be working, that they actually be engaged in productive labor. Um, it's only a requirement that you spend the money on payroll, you know, as set forth 75% within the first eight weeks following the um, receipt of the funds. And, you know, that's, um, that's a tough thing for some business owners to swallow, I think. And we've, we've talked to our clients about this recently, but um, at the end of the day, this is a conduit to get funds to employees. Um, and it's a conduit to do that without the business owner having to come out of pocket and pay these employees during this time. And I think if you, if you remember that, and you think of that as you're making decisions about when to bring employees back, when to put them back on payroll, how to spend the money, it will really guide a lot of your decisions in this area. Um, as I said, there are some more complicated, you know, um, labor and employment issues that some of the companies have with respect to layoffs they've done and bringing people back. So, you know, you do want to be thoughtful about this and, and get some advice if you've got a complicated situation. But I advised a client this morning at 7.30 this morning, I think the words out of my mouth were, you know, put them back on the payroll. They may not be working for you right now, but you're getting the money to your employees and you're maximizing your loan forgiveness under the act. You can still use 25% of the money to pay rent and pay other expenses, which may be more directly um, support or benefit, if you will, um, the owner of the company. Um, but the point of that, that forgiveness is to get money in the pockets of employees, even if they're not engaged and even if they're not waiting tables, it's the best way to put it. Great. Thank you. And in that same spirit, I think that answers this next question. So if you wanted to spend 100% of this on payroll, could you get forgiveness of that 100% if it's all spent on payroll? Eric, do you want to take that? Yeah, the answer is yes. You, it's not a hard cap in the seventy-five percent. It's just the seventy-five percent. At least seventy-five percent needs to be on payroll. Yep. And just kind of echoing what Anne Marie said, and I was looking at a couple of the additional questions, specifically about when are we going to get the money, and two, when does the eight weeks actually start? Um, so let's take the first one. When are we actually going to get the money? We don't know, although the presidents and the treasury, they've made it very clear that they want money in people's hands very quickly. So I don't know if Anne-Marie has any more specific guidance of when people are going to get to receive the money. I don't know of anybody that received money yet, but we know, we hope that it's going to be very soon. And then when does the eight week period actually start? The act says it starts from the date of the origination of the loan. So in our view, at least in my view, that is when the loan is funded. So I don't think it's st stemming from the application date. It's stemming from the funding of the loan. Great. Thank you. Yeah, that's um, definite. It's the origination date. So it's when you get the money. Um, one question, what if you are not a U.S. citizen? Does this still apply to you? If the owner of the business is not a U.S. citizen? Correct. Yeah, the, the entity itself, it fo the, the focus is on the employees who are located in the United States and its territories. I gotta be honest, I can't remember top of head 
if the owner has to be a U.S. citizen or not. I just don't know the answer to that question. Um, but I'll make a note, unless Eric knows, and, and we'll endeavor to get you guys that information as you post our, our materials. Um, I suspect that it's in the client alert, which is, which is on our site, that folks can access. Um, but I don't remember top of head, and I don't want to give people the wrong information about that. I know the key focus is on the employees located here, um, and, but I'm not sure about the ownership structure. I'll, we'll figure that out. Okay, great. Um, I, I did notice, I'll, 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 I'll mention this, I noticed a lot of questions about um, what goes into the $100,000 max, if you will, for calculating payroll as part of the um, application process. Um, and also, you know, can you pay your employees overtime as part of the use of this? Um, there's a lot of details that goes into those answers from a labor and employment perspective as well. Um, so I'm loath to give big general guidance on that. Um, I would refer folks, again, we've got a list of frequently answered questions, which is posted on our site in the area of labor and employment. Um, so when you're looking for that kind of granular detail about um, what goes into the number and, you know, can you pay employees overtime and the like, especially even if they're not working, I would also refer people, if you just go on the site, and you can, you can filter it by labor and employment, and you can also filter it by frequently asked questions. I think that'll be a good resource for a lot of people that have those kind of more granular um, you know, questions about that. Um, back to you, Abby. Yeah, so here's one question. If you're only applying for EIDL, does that mean that the $10,000 advance would not be forgivable, let's say if you're not eligible for PPP? Um, the guidance by the SBA says that the $10,000 advance does not need to be repaid. Um, the, the cross against that is if you take out a PPP loan, but um, the guidance from the SBA is that the $10,000 is, is not to be repaid. Great, thank you. Um, let's talk about entity types. So an LLC, for example, can you confirm, is that uh, able to get an EIDL? Um, either a PPP or an EIDL, yeah. It will look to the ownership structure within the LLC for the 20% threshold. So, you know, any one owner who owns 20% or more of that entity who has an interest, I should say, in the LLC of 20% or greater will be obligated to provide a guarantee for the loan. Got it. Um, there are a lot rolling in here, let's see. Um, I saw one, someone was asking, you know, I am a sole proprietor and the only employee, can I apply now or do I wait until April 10th? Where can I find who to submit the application to? The answer is yes, you should apply now. You should apply soonest. I spoke with my sister this morning who is a sole proprietor and said the same thing to her. Um, in many cases, applying to your existing lender is a really good route if your lender is making these loans because just kind of shortcuts, you've got someone to call maybe, that sort of thing. But you don't have to do it through your existing lender. You know, a lot of major banks, and I'm not going to plug any bank in particular, um, but a lot of major banks are participating in this. Some of them rolled out their applications over the weekend. In some cases, the applications were only available to existing customers who got kind of a head start maybe on the application. And I don't want to cause any kind of panic, you know, yelling fire in a crowded movie theater. Um, I just, we recommend that you get the application in soon. Um, because at some point this pool of money will dry up. So is it, you know, today, tomorrow, next week, who knows? Um, but if, if, I, if I were one applying, I would take steps to apply now. And, you know, if you don't have an existing lender, find a bank that's making these loans, go online. Uh, all of this is done online, by the way. Um, the SBA has the application posted. So you can see it's a two page application. It is I think, in my view, I mean, I've, I've physically seen people filling it out 
it is not challenging once you you know approach it with the right numbers in terms of what your payroll costs are um but i would encourage people to do it you know soonest and it's all online you just submit it all online the lender will respond and say this is the backup documentation we need you submit that the lender will process it that's like in a nutshell kind of what that process is Um, one more. So let's say you're the owner and you don't necessarily submit payroll for yourself each pay period. Is that taken into account as you're calculating your payroll costs? Um, yeah, what I have seen is in some cases you've got maybe a sole proprietorship where someone takes most of their income in a K-1, you know, at the end of the year. Um, but they also have a payroll element where they're paying themselves a salary you know, prorated across 12 months. Um, I will say this, there is, you know, what you want to do is prorate your payroll. And again, you can't exceed the $100,000 threshold um, across your 12 months. So, um, you know, that's the number that you put in the application. Um, again, you're limited to $100,000. So if you're in a situation where you basically pay out at the end of the year, you get a K-1 for that. You got to look at the limits under the program. Um, and then you look at the 12 month, you know, the 12 month spread on it as well. Um, there was one question. Can a bank require a guarantee even though the application does not require it? This is for a PPP loan, or I guess it could be for an EIDL loan in the case of a loan under $200,000. The answer is no. Um, the banks have to issue these loans in accordance with the SBA guidelines and the legislation. So there, there ought be no guarantee for a PPP loan, for example. That's just not a thing. It ought not be a thing. So if you think it's a thing with your bank, you probably want to look maybe at another, um, at another, uh, another lender. Great. Okay. I think just real quick, last question to wrap things up, let's say once you apply, um, you get in your application, do you have any guidance around next steps or any idea of timeline? Eric, do you wanna discuss that and then I can wrap it up? Yeah, as I mentioned before, we don't, we don't know on the timing. Um, we hope it's soon, we hope it's as soon as this week. That's what the government's indicating, but we just don't know. Um, as far as next steps, I'm not familiar with any. Obviously, stay in touch with the banker that's helping facilitate the loan application. Make sure they have all the information they need. Uh, to the extent there's any issues with the loan application, I would expect that to be communicated uh, and the banker would have that information. So uh, once it's submitted, I would follow up with that person if you're not hearing information. Yeah, you could also, um, I agree with, with Eric, and we really don't know. I think people are projecting you know, within a couple of weeks, we're gonna to start to see funds flowing on, on the PPP loan. Um, the, um, what you can also do is check your bank's website, and in some cases, they've posted the kinds of materials that they're going to require as a follow-up. So you submit the application, and from my observation over the weekend, a couple of major lenders, their response to the application was, you know, thank you for submitting it. You will be receiving a further email from us regarding the requirements. And sort of in anticipation of that follow-up, pull together your business records, pull together tax returns, pull together, um, you know, uh, if you look at certain websites for different banks, they'll kind of give you a, a list of the usual. Um, but just, you know, have those kinds of documents, tax returns, payroll records, et cetera, ready so that if you are asked for them, um, you can quickly submit them and convert this application into cash so that you can convert the cash into a grant under the uh, under the act. And so with that, back to you, Abby. Yes, thank you both so much. We really appreciate it. That is all we have for you today. I know there were a ton of questions that rolled in that we weren't able to get to. I do wanna remind everyone that the Generator team is hosting one-on-one -on -one office hours um, or one-on-one -on -one consultations between you and your business so that we can answer any of the questions that we missed. So definitely look back into the intro emails that you received and sign up for one of those one-on-one -on -one sessions so that we can get your questions answered.
Also note, we are going, we have recorded this webinar, and so it will be posted um, up on Generator's website and as well as our Vimeo and YouTube pages. So please check those out or feel free to reach out to someone from the Generator team if you need any help accessing that along with other resources. Um, thank you all so much for joining. Thank you, um, Anne-Marie and Eric. We really appreciate it. And we hope to see many of you on the next webinar. Thanks, everybody. Thank you for having us and good luck and be safe. Bye, everyone.